All right. Hello, and welcome back to another fun-filled episode of The Hammercast. I am your host, Alex, the Hebrew Hammer Salkan, although I have to admit, I feel like maybe I should abdicate that throne because uh, I have a real-life Hebrew Hammer here with me, Nathan Levy, uh, active fighter on the UFC roster. He's got a big fight coming up May 16th against Mike Beast Boy Davis, and we're going to be talking a bit about that. But before we jump into all of that, I want to give people a little bit of an insight into his origin story, how he got to where he got to, because it's actually there's a lot of really cool details into it. And uh, we'll kick things off shortly. I want to remind my listeners, of course, that if you have not, you can feel free to get my free nine-minute kettlebell and bodyweight challenge at 9minutechallenge.com. It is designed to be done along with your regular training as opposed to like a detour from what you're already doing. And it's free, so who can say no to that? So it's 9minutechallenge.com, and it is all yours. And uh, without further ado, Natan, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. So I've been watching you for a while. I've been very interested and indeed intrigued by uh, the fact that you've come out of seemingly nowhere from you know very humble beginnings, starting with, I won't give, I won't give away your entire story, but starting as sort of a hobbyist in the martial arts world and then deciding that you were going to take on the world of mixed martial arts. And, you know, one question that I think probably comes to people's minds pretty often is how exactly do you get involved in such a thing? And like, what exactly is your history with martial arts? Like you got started in childhood, but it wasn't MMA from the outside. It was a more traditional martial arts background. Is that correct? Uh, kind of correct. Uh, I wouldn't even say childhood. It was like teenage years. Mm. So I started out consider what's considered pretty late. Um, <clears throat> started training pretty late. Started MMA pretty late. Started competing pretty late. But, uh, you know, we got somewhere. And, uh, yeah. And your uh, your initial foray into martial arts was with uh, Kung Fu, correct? Yeah, I did like a mix of Kung Fu and, and karate. Started when I was 15. Uh, I've done a little bit of different stuff before that, but I was never, I never sticked around for too long. Uh, then uh, at 15 years old, so I started training. Quickly, it went from, uh, you know, a couple times a week to, to every day from uh, one session to doing two or three sessions, one after the other. And, uh, you know, I would say hobbyist because it's not a competitive field, mm -hmm. but it, for me, it was not a hobby. For me, it was a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's really what got you into making, wanting to make it into a career? Because I think a lot of people look at it as, kind of as I mentioned, it's like they see it as a hobby. It seems like unless you have some sort of an early competitive edge, a lot of people don't even think about trying to do it professionally. So was this the sort of a thing that because it became a lifestyle for you, you thought, how can I turn this into a career and how can I make this something that, you know, I actually take the world by storm by doing? I had made it into a career, but by teaching. So I started at 15. At 16, I already, you know, flew to Japan to train. Um, when I was 18, I got my black belt in Japan. And then when I was 19, I uh, went back to Israel. And the, the only thing I could do was teach. This was like the, the next thing in the order that I was going by. So that's what made sense. Mm -hmm. And I was actually doing pretty good. Uh, you know, of course, just like being a practitioner at first, you're a beginner, trainer, beginner coach. Uh, you get better at it. You get more students, you open one gym. Um, then I opened another gym. So I was doing really good. But at night, I would watch UFC. And, you know, I would think this is something different from what I'm doing. I'm a karate practitioner and instructor. And what they're doing is a different thing called MMA. They're fighting. It would be cool to do that, but it's not like my path. Mm -hmm. And, you know... I did, maybe I was like uh, a little bit hiding it from myself at first, but I did want that to be my path. Like I did want to do that. 
but I thought like, this is not my sport. I'm here, this is over there. And uh, I'm gonna live my life as a karate practitioner and teacher. And um, one thing that maybe made an impact was uh, Lyoto Machida was actually a karate fighter, won a UFC championship. So that was pretty cool to see. And then other than that, I think just being more into the sport and watching it more often and reading about the fighters and just at some point my passion for it just grew and grew and it overtook my passion for karate. And what level of uh, influence would you say that karate has over your striking style in the octagon? I mean, I'm imagining that probably there's a pretty strong base for it, but there's also a lot of other stuff that you have to do. So do you, do you feel that you have the same level of focus on karate as your primary striking style, similar to Lyoto Machida, or have you sort of integrated it with other things like Muay Thai and boxing and things like that? I've definitely integrated it. I feel like, uh, you know, now I've been doing MMA for longer than I've been doing only karate. Mm. Right? For a long period of time, karate was all my life. It was everything I did. And when I transitioned to MMA, I was a karate guy. Now I've been an MMA guy, even though I still practice karate. I've been an MMA guy for longer than I've been a karate guy. Mm -hmm. But still the roots are the roots. Absolutely. And the good habits... And the bad habits, a lot of them are still there. So, you know, always trying to figure, uh, always trying to fix like some bad habits and find ways to use the good habits and the good roots. Um, but I'm definitely like, it's been a long time ago that I've uh, released this like, oh, oh, I'm representing karate. Oh, I got to do this. And because that's how you do it in karate. Like, mm -hmm. The moment I flew to Vegas uh, to be a UFC fighter and got here and actually realized how things work and, you know, I saw that like karate is not going to do, you know, at first I flew here, I thought I'm going to use my karate, learn some jujitsu and I can fight in the UFC. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah. There's sort of like a pecking order of things that you have to be good at in UFC. And I think that there are some things where, you know, you might be able to use elements of it. I like. I think like Carl Parisian with his judo, you know, he had to adapt it to a, a no-gi sort of an environment. And uh, I would imagine that it's it's somewhat similar with, you know, stuff like karate and things of that nature. But um, it seems like mixed martial arts has kind of started getting bigger in Israel. But I know even at the time when I was living there, most of the people who were fans weren't trying to set up anything locally. So I, did you ever get a chance to to practice it in within Israel? Or was that... Just kind of like, I'm going to go to Vegas and I'm just going to, you know, test my luck there. <clears throat> At first, it was just Vegas because two things. First one was I wasn't from the scene in Israel. I didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I, thought, when I told people I want to do MMA, I want to be in the UFC, they would kind of mock me and tell me stuff like, uh, oh, what belt are you in jiu-jitsu? Oh, I've never done jujitsu. I'm a karate guy. Well, if you want to go to Vegas, first you gotta be a brown belt in jujitsu before you even think about doing MMA. Or first you gotta be Israeli MMA champion before you know you you leave the country. Like there was no even such thing. So what I was supposed to do, like wait until they make a championship in Israel yeah. so I can participate and win it. Um so I just, uh, you know, I wanted to be the best in karate. I flew to Japan and trained there. And the moment I thought I want to be the best in MMA and that's what I want to do, I bought a plane ticket to Las Vegas. One way, I assume. You got to have a two way to get in. They won't uh, let you in with a one way. That's true. Yeah, I guess I forgot. You know, you have a privilege sometimes being an American. You can just fly on a one way ticket in most places. And they're like, ah, well, he's probably going to leave anyway. But yeah, no, that that does make a lot of sense. Now, uh, I like the way that you approached it because I think so many people have this mindset of like sequential rather than simultaneous. They're like, okay, well, first I've got to do this, then this, and then that. And a lot of times they don't get past one of those middle steps that's going to get them to ultimately what should be the, the last step. 
And you were just kind of like, you know what, if I want to get good at it, I need to do what I've done before, the work before. I went to Japan and I got my black belt there. So I'm going to learn, you know, I'm going to hit the ground running in Vegas. And uh, what was your experience like? I mean, was that sort of, uh, were you like, you mentioned, you know, karate you realized was not going to be enough. Uh, did you find that you picked up on the grappling elements of mixed martial arts relatively quickly? Or was that kind of a learning curve? Um, I'll tell you two things. One, about what you just said with the order. Another thing, you know, everybody, so many external voices were, were telling me that I couldn't do it but also a big voice inside me. I had a friend in my gym who was still kicking my ass every time we sparred. And he's a, he's a smaller guy than me. Uh, and he, always, he was always beating me. Like sometimes I could get close to beating him, but you know, uh, and I would think to myself, wait, wait, I need to beat him before I go to America, right? Oh, I wanna go to America, but wait, I still can beat this guy in the gym. It doesn't matter. That's nonsense. Because mm -hmm. once I left the little pond and went to swim in the ocean, then when I got back, the difference was, it was not the same anymore. Mm -hmm. And if I would have stayed and waited to beat him, maybe I wouldn't have beat him to this day. Um, and about the curve, uh, it was a learning curve. But actually, you know, I fell in love with Jiu-Jitsu. I really enjoyed it. Um, I knew my time in America was limited because I was on the, on the visa waiver program. So I had three months only, mm -hmm. um, and I had to make the most of it. So I would train four or five times a day even, and two, three of these sessions would be jujitsu, some MMA, um, some boxing, some Muay Thai, but mainly I would do jujitsu and, um, uh, and like I, I, caught up pretty quick i think yeah i think if you've got enough of a background even in some sort of like kind of an unrelated martial art like a striking martial art you understand at least the principles like you know like defense and like <clears throat> what you have to do to try to get control of your opponent so if you can just translate those things into like a submission art or grappling in general i would imagine that just having that experience fighting means that you at least get over some of the other uh hurdles that a lot of people have like i know I'm more of a hobbyist when it comes to martial arts. So for me, I remember when I was really young, it was like, I didn't want to get hit in the face. You know, once I got used to occasionally taking a glove to the face, well, then it's a lot easier to do all the other things that you have to do. So I think I would imagine it's probably somewhat similar with jujitsu. Would you say so? Um, as far as like, once you master one skill, you, once you master one skill, you get more comfortable mastering other skills and mm -hmm. you kind of have a blueprint of how that can happen. And, you know, you understand, Oh, if I only apply myself, like I applied myself in one thing, I can do it on the other. Yes, completely. On the other hand, I'll give you an example. My in karate, like the horse stance, you're always opening, opening your hips and opening your knees out hard. Right. And all the fight stances, and then in jujitsu, all of a sudden, everything needs to be tight. Yeah. And you got to put your knees together and you got to, you know, use your adductor strong and use your hamstring. And I was not used to, to using these muscles like that. So that was something that was hard for me. I would always find myself um, like my body didn't want to cooperate. I understood what the drill is, but I was always doing it a little bit wrong. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I got there. I don't know if I would have gotten there faster or slower without karate, but um, I think there's also, of course, many things that helped. Certainly. Now, when you went back, you mentioned you were there, you had like a three-month uh, <clears throat> visa in, in the U.S. Did you end up going back to Israel and being like, okay, I need to keep up my, my skills. I needed to start practicing, finding somewhere to do jujitsu or finding somewhere to practice these other things? Or what, what was the next stage after that? So when I left for America the first time, I didn't know that you cannot extend your visa on the visa waiver program. So when I flew there, I thought I'll be able to, to apply and extend it. I thought, you know, maybe I'd find a gym, a coach that could help me, you know, some paperwork. 
But when I got there quickly, I realized I couldn't. And I had already closed my gyms and shut down my businesses. So after three months of hard training, I was begging my coach to fight. And he told me I wasn't ready. You know, you're not ready yet. Go back home. Do what you got to do. Save up some money. Come back. And, you know, we'll get more training in. And when you're ready, you'll, fi you'll fight. So I went back home. And now I couldn't teach anymore. I had no more students. I had, you know, given them to all kinds of different teachers I recommended for them and stuff like that. And I had to work security. Mm. Um, so I would work security all night and then train during the day to, you know, with the hope dream of getting back to Las Vegas, it wasn't easy. And, um, the question you were asking was, <clears throat> did I get into jujitsu and stuff? So I'm very sad to say that I didn't because you know, again, I'm sad to say it, but it was like frowned upon to train at different gyms. And, uh, you know, the coach was like uh, kind of pressuring me to only do MMA in America. And when I'm in Israel, keep sharpening up my, my karate, right? Because mm. I'm not going to do karate in America. So I'm sharpening my karate, my striking in Israel. And then when I go back to America, I can do all the jujitsu stuff. That's actually, you know, a very uh, cultish mindset that I don't agree with today. And, uh, and I'm thankful I left. But at the time, I didn't want to dishonor my gym, dishonor my coach. Uh, you know, he was telling me, you're still an instructor in Israel. People are going to see you going to learn something from somebody else. Like, who cares? So yeah. what? I learned something from anybody. There's no shame in it. Right. But uh, I listened, unfortunately, and at the time, I go back to Israel and just do security all night. And then during the day, a little bit of striking, a little bit of like kicks and punches, a lot of forms and stuff that is kind of useless for MMA. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would just dream about going back to Vegas and, and keeping the journey going. Certainly. Yeah, you know, it's very strange to think about that sort of cultish mindset that you brought up because it is it does seem common and it's not just in, you know, the martial arts world. You see it like in a lot of different disciplines where it's like the idea that you would go and learn from somebody else who's maybe doing something the same thing but differently or something along those lines would be viewed as dishonorable or disloyal or something like that. When in reality, you know, you're the only one who's in the octagon fighting. You're not in there with a team. You know, you it's it, it's up to you how you how you apply yourself and how you prepare. So that is very strange, but I'm glad that uh, you know at least from that you were able to learn. Okay, maybe this is not the right coach for me. I assume that you've gone on to different coaches since then. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if uh, if I may say, I I've, I've always found it interesting that like in Israel, for instance, martial arts training is pretty common. It's like it's not that hard to find martial arts schools and you know, all sorts of different disciplines. But among Jews in America, it's a lot less common to practice martial arts. And I wish it would be the opposite. I wish that they would learn how to, that more Jews would learn how to defend themselves, particularly given, you know, the continuing rise of anti-Semitism and, and uh, all sorts of new and, uh, let's say, dangers we thought had gone away and kind of haven't gone away. And so, you know, even though I'm thinking about Jews specifically, let's just think people in general, people who who feel the need to learn how to defend themselves and maybe not, you know, because they want to they want to compete or anything like that. But they want to know how to how to employ some real world self-defense. What are some things that you think people need to know first and foremost, uh, just in terms of do they should they start uh, working with a particular martial art? Should they look for a particular type of coach or a particular type of school? What kind of suggestions do you have? I, I think um, definitely the coach is probably the most important thing. Um, there are good styles. There are bad styles. I don't like saying, oh, there's no bad styles because unfortunately there are. 
but the training method is usually going to be implied by the by the trainer mm-hmm. so trainer is the most important thing definitely uh you know you're looking for somebody that's level headed knowledgeable has experience none of this uh, cultish you know behaviors mm-hmm. uh we can talk about you know red flags and stuff but one of them is oh you can't train anywhere else right um especially if it's a, a different martial art right and um and i would say first learn how to strike because yeah most fights end up on the ground but uh 100% of them start on the feet mm-hmm. so i would learn how to punch and and kick first mm-hmm. and you know given that you come from israel what is your opinion on let's say krav maga as a self defense system for people who don't really want to compete but they do want to know how to protect themselves and their family in a sort of a real world situation <clears throat> you know a real world situation on one hand you don't want to compete on the other hand competition is the closest thing to a real world situation mm-hmm. um yes it's controlled you do want a controlled environment for your training if not training could be hey go start a fight with somebody in the street right we'll see yeah. if it works but we want safety so you want something that's controlled but you want somebody that's fighting back so i think krav maga is great the thing about krav maga is it's a assistant that's meant to teach you self defense tools and techniques that are simple they're taken from different martial arts and it should be always evolving mm-hmm. because krav maga is not about traditional style right it's not karate oh this form has been practiced krav maga should be evolving if you have a tv and you can watch the ufc you can kind of tell what works and what doesn't uh if you have youtube and you can look for street fights you can kind of see what works and what doesn't so as long as the art is evolving as long as the trainer is evolving i think it's great but any style that you don't do sparring that you don't do somewhat even controlled but competition inside even the the train room mm-hmm. then it's not real mm-hmm. so you can practice theory all day long you can go to the dmv.com and practice you know the test all day long you're not going to know how to drive mm-hmm. so you need to compete i for example uh train here at the uh, Nomad Krav Maga it's a gym i help out uh, doing their striking curriculum i'm good friends with the owner we train together we we teach each other and uh they do sparring they always evolving and then i think it's amazing for for self defense mhm so it's it's still pract- it still follows the same rules as any other martial arts school essentially is that there has to be level headed teacher somebody who has an open mind about how to evolve and how to help the students actually get what they need and then of course they actually have to practice it so it can't just be drilling it's got to be you know let's see what this works let's see how this works let's see how you apply it let's see what mistakes you're making things like that yeah a lot of drilling that's great mm-hmm. but also a lot of resistance yeah certainly you know one thing uh one of the reasons that i felt compelled to reach out to you is a couple months ago i saw a great video i was very happy to see it of you taking on an internet anti-semite who had been i think he had been uh dming you all sorts of nasty stuff and so you invited him you said why don't you just come to the ufc training center and we'll settle our differences the old fashioned way and uh so there was a video of it and you know, allegedly this guy had some sort of a martial arts background but it was interesting to see the difference between at you and him because it didn't even look like you were fighting all that hard it looked like you were just toying with him and you know exerting your will on him as you wanted and there was very little that he could do in return and you know obviously one of the reasons i see something like that and i enjoy it it's just like it's nice to see people who are it's nice to see when uh, jews can stand up for themselves and demonstrate even physically not just intellectually like in a debate atmosphere or something like that that uh, we can be formidable opponents 
And that was one of the things in particular that uh, to me stood out as uh, a great example of the need for self-defense in you know the Jewish community specifically is how I look at things because I think in terms of like you know are, are people that I know or synagogue members going to get assaulted you know on their way to synagogue or are they going to you know get harassed out in public and did you notice a big like uptick in followers or people reaching out to you or uh, people coming to the uh, nomad Krav Maga for instance from the Jewish community or from elsewhere just seeing you know what the, sort of a controlled let's say fight like that would look like? Yeah. So first thing is I didn't invite him. He invited himself to the oh, gym. Oh, I see. Okay. He said, you know, he said, I'm going to come to your gym and show you this, show you that. So I said, sure, come, you know, I'm not really in the habit of inviting moron Nazis to the gym. Right. But he wanted to come, he insisted. So I said, sure, you know, I even offered to Venmo him for the gas. Because I knew it would be a, a good time, mm -hmm. but uh, there was there was a big uh, you know a big r rise in like messages I get and and stuff like that, which is great. But uh, yeah, at the end of the day, I'm I'm happy it made people feel good. I'm happy it made people laugh. I think it was pretty funny. Uh, and at the end of the day, my my point was. Like you said, you know, just to kind of teach him a lesson, not send him to the hospital, not uh, kill him. I don't know if this guy has got a, you know, he says he's got a black belt in karate and black belt in Taekwondo. Like, cool. I don't know if he had heart surgery a month ago. Like, I don't know if what's this guy's problem. I don't want to kill him. I don't want to yeah. hurt him. Um, and I do hope he remembers, you know, that not only he was dominated by a Jew, which, which he sees as, uh, you know, himself as superior from, mm -hmm. but also that this Jew showed him some kindness and didn't beat him to, to a pulp. Yeah. But at the end of the day, this is all fun. And, and, but if Jews don't learn self-defense or don't get to this point from this video, then, then I miss the mark, right? Mm -hmm. I do want uh, Jews to learn self-defense. I actually, I was interviewed about it like uh, a year ago, uh, even before the war. And I stated, you know, for, for a newspaper here in America, that every Jew should learn self-defense and every Jew should ca carry a firearm. And they let the second part out of the article, maybe it didn't fit the, the narrative of the, of the newspaper, right? It's not political for me. Any Jew should, be, should have a tank. You know, if you ask me, tank, firearm, black belt in karate, Krav Maga, and anything else. Uh, this is what we have to do to keep ourselves safe, to keep our family safe. Um, lift weights, be fit, learn self-defense, carry a firearm, learn how to use it, learn how, you know, how to, to keep it safe. And uh, that's not a choice we have right now. That's a must. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I think it's a sort of a thing that people don't want to believe. They want to think like, okay, maybe things will blow over. You know, maybe, maybe it'll be different where I live. But uh, like I've said, I think that the trend just shows that it's not moving in that direction where things are going to be normal again. And uh, it's one of those hard pills that we're going to have to swallow that, you know, this is something you're going to have to learn how to do and take pretty seriously because it's, it is serious, you know, like it doesn't have to be, um, uh, it doesn't have to be some sort of like a major assault in your house. It could be somebody just attacks you while you're out on the street. And if you're not prepared for it, very unlikely someone's going to jump in to help you. I mean, most of the videos you talked about street fights, it's just bystanders just sit back and, you know, watch people get assaulted. Nobody jumps in to help. So you're really, maybe unknown. they'll film that can help. They might film it. Yeah. I mean, maybe it would help in court, but you want to show up in court with like a neck brace, like in a <laughs> wheelchair, or do you yeah. want to show up, uh, you know, in a little bit better condition? Yeah. Now, uh, on the topic of fights, you've got uh, another upcoming fight. This will be March 16th of 2024 up against Mike Davis, a.k.a. Beast Boy, I believe is his uh, his nickname. So 
I'm curious because having never really competed, what does a competition preparation look like? I know that you recently got the message that you were going to be having this fight. I think it was about maybe two months prior, essentially. Uh, now, you're always in shape for a fight, but what does it look like to peak for a fight to get ready specifically for a couple of rounds in the octagon? Yeah, you know, it's a grueling training camp. Um, a lot of skill work. Uh, usually we do more general skill, meaning, you know, just improve everywhere. Mm -hmm. When you got a fight and you're fighting a, a guy uh, and you have, you know, you know, ahead of time, then you start preparing more for the person themselves. So what are my strong suit against him? What's his strong suit? Uh, what do I think he's going to try and do? What am I going to try and do? What do I think he thinks I'm going to try and do? And maybe I can surprise him. Um, and a lot of conditioning to be able to fight for, for 15 minutes uh, straight. Uh, hopefully we can finish the fight earlier. But if it goes there that I need to fight for 15 minutes uh, to be able to, to press on the gas and, and go for the whole time and win enough rounds. Mm -hmm. Now, do you watch tapes of your opponents? Uh, I, one of the reasons I ask is I thought this was just standard practice, but I saw a video recently of uh, former light heavyweight champion Quentin Rampage Jackson saying he never watched any of his opponents' fights. He said he would let his coaches do it. Um, and I thought that was strange because everybody else I've ever heard has always said, yeah, I, I watch their fights. You know, We study them. We see what they do. We watch this, that, and the other thing. He said he would leave it up to his coaches so that they would prepare him. And then he would just, he wouldn't focus on that. He would just focus on what he was going to do in real time in the octagon. How common is that? To me, it seems uncommon, but I'm not the expert. It's, uh, it's not very common, but some people do it. Some people are like, no, I don't like watching tape. Where does it come from? Maybe, you know, they just don't want to, it doesn't matter to them. They mm -hmm. think exactly that, like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I don't care about what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. which is fine, but if the guy, you know, has got a, a certain strike or certain submission that he's very good at, maybe you should see it mm -hmm. and practice defending it. If your coaches watch the film and they see it and then they make you work for it, I guess it kind of translates. But I like watching the opponents because it's not, it's not only about the techniques and the moves. Uh, if you write on a piece of paper everything he does, um, I feel that's not the complete picture. I feel like there's a, a timing. See what his rhythm is like. Uh, you know, how much does he bounce before he goes? Mm -hmm. um, what does he do when he gets pressured? What does he do when somebody takes a step back? Does he take a step forward? Does he take a step back himself? Does he, like, I want to see all that stuff and kind of get a feel for the guy. And I feel it helps me in the fight. Kind of like how some people, you know, first round and they'll kind of go easy. Not easy, but be a little bit more cautious and kind of try to make reads mm -hmm. and get the rhythm of the fighter. I'd rather get the rhythm of the fighter before the fight. Yes, when we start fighting, there's going to be some fine tuning, but I kind of know what I'm expecting. Mm -hmm. So I can start timing stuff immediately. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it seems like that's sort of the art side of the fighting. You know, we think of martial arts. I think a lot of people think about just flowery movements or what have you. But I like the way you're describing it because it sounds like the art is in the strategy. You're like, I'm going to look at, you know, what he more commonly does so that I can uh, prepare myself for a sim for something happening like that within the fight itself. And it's not just about techniques. It's about to some uh, to some degree, like shaping what you do into something that you know uh is potentially gonna help you become victorious so it's very different from just like how many punches did i throw you know how hard are my punches what's you know what's the score when i hit this particular instrument or, or what have you that we might look at that as like the science of fighting but the art is really figuring out how to uh how to outmatch your opponent by finding what his weak spots are and then just exploiting them exactly yeah, very interesting. Uh, so 
what are the what are some of the things that you find in particular are useful for let's say like the strength and conditioning side of things because i would imagine most of the conditioning probably comes from just the mat work you know or like the bag work uh sparring things like that do you do anything else i know ufc performance center has got tons and tons of you know really advanced conditioning equipment and strength equipment and and things like that do you train with this sort of a thing or do you just keep it more old school um kind of depends on the on the time of year and and the camp you know all this stuff is nice i don't know if it's a, a must you know to have the the scientist guy measure your vo2 max mm -hmm. okay it's been measured what's the difference you know if i knew or i didn't know uh i do like the data and going by it i'm not saying like no but i think you can be a great fighter without all that stuff Mm -hmm. If you have a coach that understands uh, a little bit about like uh, like power systems, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like how like to build and stuff, yeah. energy systems, how to build cardio, how to build like uh, muscle uh, endurance. All that kind of happens naturally on the mat because you're always playing the sport that you're going to perform at. Mm -hmm. So is it good to to go to the PI and do a, a training that's only muscle endurance or only cardio? Yeah, sure. That's great. I like it. I do it. Uh, is it good to lift? Yeah, it's very good for you. Makes you stronger. But uh, is it all like super necessary? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it seems like opinions really vary quite a bit. I know, for instance, like Judo Jean LaBelle. He used to say, you know, strength training and conditioning is a waste of time. The only thing he would do, I think, is like throw a tire around. Otherwise, he would just get on the mat and throw people. And then you've got other people who have like really sophisticated protocols. Uh, it seems like a lot of it just comes down to what the fighter wants to do and then what they're able to actually recover from. Because if you're hitting a really hard weight session and then you got to spar and now you have no energy to spar, you know, you're going to have to decide, do I want to keep the goal the goal or do I just want to lift really heavy? And uh, yeah, that's why yeah. I lift after sparring. Makes perfect sense. Now, because if uh, I'm tired for sparring and I lift less, who cares? Yeah, no, that's a. I think that's a pretty smart protocol. I remember there's a strength and conditioning specialist, Charles Staley, who said that that's exactly what martial artists should do, particularly competitive ones, because it's a lot easier to uh, to control the variables in weight training and strength training in general, um, and particularly do so on the fly, whereas in a you know in a in a sparring session or something like that if you're tired it can really throw a lot of things off and you're you don't get your skill work in you're slower you're you're just not as sharp so it makes more sense to do it later yeah and also it's just much more dangerous i feel because the time where you get injured is when you're tired that's exactly. it you get injured because your nervous system is tired and you don't have time to react to something. Somebody kicks you, somebody sweeps you, takes you down and you make a dumb mistake because you're tired. You put your hand, maybe you leave your knee where it shouldn't be. Yeah. And, and this is how injury happens. And of course, brain damage. If you're not sharp in sparring, you're not moving, you're not moving your head, you're getting hit, you're getting brain damage. Yeah. Yeah. More of it. A very salient reminder for the people who do take Natan's suggestion to start training and start sparring. Uh, stay sharp so that you're not blocking a bunch of punches with your face. Wanderlei Silva style. He was quite good at that. But I think he's also admitted, yeah, he's he's getting to that CTE stage where the, I don't remember exactly what the, the term is, but it's basically like long-term brain damage from having gotten hit a whole bunch of times. So. Uh, well, I think we're right about at uh, 45 minutes, and uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer because I'm sure that you've got a lot of butt kicking that you still have to do for the rest of the day. Um, where can people follow you online? Where can people find you? And uh, and where can people watch the fight? Uh, people can watch the fight on uh, ESPN, ESPN Plus, the app. And um, people can follow me at... Uh, Nathan Levy, N-A-T-A-N underscore L-E-V-Y on Instagram, uh, X. Uh, what else is out there? I think there's Facebook. I think I follow you on Facebook. Face yeah, Facebook, uh, YouTube. 
And also I have my website, levymma.com, where they can buy uh, jujitsu merch and sign up for my newsletter. Highly recommend it, folks. I will make sure that I will put all those links in the description or the show notes, depending on where you are consuming this episode. So, Natan, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. And folks, have fun and happy training.